Normally, we observe commemorations for saints and martyrs, and I say something at the beginning of the service, and we don't do much else. Today is different, and I think it's important that we talk about why it's different. It's not just that the Emmanuel Nine are contemporary martyrs, and it's not just that this weekend was also the celebra- celebration of Juneteenth, and that this is the first year that that is a federal, or that it was just declared a federal holiday. I felt it was important this year to mark this commemoration because the storm has finally come. This storm has been brewing for 400 years, ever since the first enslaved Africans arrived on American shores, ever since people began to believe that the inherent otherness of some human beings made them inferior to others. The clouds have been gathering through chattel slavery and civil war, through racist immigration restrictions and the mass internment of American citizens during wartime, through unjust policing and incarceration practices and lynchings. For decades, for centuries even, the peace has held in spite of these darkening skies. So what's changed? Why are things happening now that didn't happen six years ago when an angry young man walked into Mother Emanuel Church to start a race war? Personally, I can't help but wonder if the change has finally begun to take hold because when George Floyd was killed last summer, the country didn't have the luxury of looking away. We couldn't go about our jobs and our vacations and our extracurricular activities because the world was locked down and we were trapped in our homes with nothing to do but reflect on the awful reality that a man lost his life to one who was sworn to protect and serve. I wonder if that event didn't serve as something of a lightning rod for all of the anxiety and the fear and the anger that we could no longer disperse in the ways we always used to. Whatever it was that finally got us to pay attention, our society is finally, it seems, beginning to wake up. Policing reform and accountability are beginning to take hold. Conversations are finally beginning to take place about how we as a nation can continue the work of healing from the trauma of slavery And we are becoming more aware of the stories and the experiences of not only black Americans, but also indigenous people and other people of color. The stagnation of this national conversation for the last 150 years, even in the face of killings and hate crimes and staggering economic inequality, bears witness to our capacity to turn away from such uncomfortable realities. For this reason, it's important for us to remember the Emmanuel Nine today. Their deaths bear witness to the truth of the evil of racism and to our complicity in it. These Christian people died in a church during a Bible study, killed by a man who also called himself a Christian. Their voices call us to remember that the church has often been propping up the sin of racism and the lie of white supremacy rather than resisting them. As Lutherans, we remember that two of the Emmanuel Nine, Reverend Pinckney and Reverend Simmons, were members of our church family as graduates of an ELCA seminary. We also remember that the man who killed them, Dylan Roof, was a member of an ELCA congregation. This tragedy reminds us that this is our problem. We are both guilty of silently condoning such evil, and we are also the victims of this destruction. But even more as we remember these things, we also commemorate these people because of the testimony of their lives, not just their deaths. These people were workers for justice. They were faithful Christians living out the love of Christ where they were blooming where they were planted. They were pillars of their community, lovers of their neighbors. They died as Christ did, welcoming the stranger, feasting on the word of God, bearing witness to one who hated them. The story of these people is a powerful witness to the fact that while Ruf's hatred did not spark the race war that he hoped it would, their love did indeed bring the abundant life that Christ promised. Instead of division and violence, the shooting at Mother Emmanuel AME Church begat forgiveness, work for justice, solidarity, 
the beginnings of healing. We look upon these people and remember them. We tell and retell their stories because their witness reminds us that though the storm is fierce and the waves are tall, and though we yet have far to go, we have been promised that we will reach the other shore. The storm in Mark's story frightened those disciples in the boat with Jesus. Now that means you know that had to be a really bad storm because a bunch of them were fishermen. They had literally spent their entire lives on that very lake sailing and weathering storms just like that. I, for one, can't blame them for being afraid. I must admit to being a bit perplexed by the way Jesus rebukes them for their cowardice and faithful, faithlessness. The story leaves me wondering, what would have been a faithful response in the midst of that storm? What is a faithful response in the midst of this one? As I look again at the story, I notice a few things. First, I notice that the disciples do not ask Jesus for help. Instead, they just seem irritated that he's not as frightened as they are. I wonder, do they feel that he doesn't care about them? Are they feeling abandoned by him in that moment? I also notice that when Jesus chastises them, he doesn't use the word I expect. The Greek word for fear is phobon, like phobia. It means to, to fear something. But that's not the word Jesus uses. Instead, he calls them delon, which is a quality rather than an action. It means to be fearful or to be timid. In other words, he's not upset at them for fearing the storm. He's upset at them for their lack of confidence. Seasoned fishermen and sailors, though they must have been, they doubted their own ability to weather this storm. They also appeared to doubt that Jesus cared enough to help them or to do anything even if he did care. It seems as though as soon as the going got rough, they were ready to give up. Perhaps a more faithful response in the midst of their storm would have been to ask Jesus for his help rather than to yell at him for not caring. What would a faithful response look like in the midst of our storm as we row towards the goal of healing from injustice and racial reconciliation? Much like the disciples in the boat, we have a long, hard journey ahead of us. But the story reminds us that we are not alone in that journey. Contrary to the disciples' fears, Jesus does care what happens to us in this storm. And even though he's awfully quiet back there right now, he does have the power to help us. Today we are reminded by Clementa and Daniel and Sharonda and Taiwanza and Depain and Cynthia and Myra and Ethel and Susie and thousands of others who have entrusted their lives to this power, just who is in the boat with us. And that though the waves may be tall and the wind fierce, with God's help, we will reach the other shore.